um, and um, and to talk about that. What I was going to so what I was going to is ramble on for about forty five minutes. Um, please, you know, um, Liz and Rob, please shut me up if I go over time and then I'll take some questions because that's and I'll try and answer as many as I can. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Yes, um, I'm a senior project manager here at, at Mullard Space Science Laboratory and there's a lovely picture of us on the right on the um, right hand side of your screen. We're in Surrey. We are the Department of Space and Climate Physics um, of University College London. So we're not actually in London, we're outside in this lovely building. I'm actually sitting in actually in the office for the first time in about 18 months at the moment. Um, we are particularly um, um, a department looking and studying scientific phenomena in space and on the earth. So I'll explain a bit about my MSSL. I'll explain about why we want to do a bit about the sun. Now, I'm going to put a proviso on this. I am not a solar physicist, all right? So if anybody really, really is hot up on solar science, you're going to trip me up. I, I apologize. This is some of these are the things I've learned over the years sitting next to solar scientists. What my job is, is I'm a sort of chartered engineer who uh, builds what the scientist needs to use in their scientific um, mission and I'll explain a bit about the solar orbiter mission which is a, a is currently in operation um, on what we've been doing for the last 14 years to get it up there a bit about the spacecraft because it's a British built spacecraft it's actually built was built in Stevenage just outside London um, and a bit about the what I'm in charge of the solar wind analyzer okay so where I'm sitting now Mullard Space Science Laboratory um, with the Department of Space and Climate Physics um, we were formally opened in 1967 um, and we're the biggest university space research group. There's about 200 of us here, um, 60 to 70 of which are engineers and support staff who actually build the instruments. And one of the first instrumentations we have is actually on the Skylark rocket assembly, which we do actually have still here at the lab. Um, and we've done over 300 missions working with the European Space Agency, with NASA, JAXA, with the Japanese CSA, with the Chinese Space Agency, um, and India and Canada, we've got lots of missions um, and heritage. And we specialize in, in the actual onboard instrumentation on the spacecraft itself. Um, the only spacecraft we actually, met, we've done some CubeSats and we did a, the aerial in the early 1980s, we did a little mini satellite called Aerial. Um, which went up, but mainly we, we build the instrumentation on, on board. And on what, what we actually do is that the scientists here, or sort of 150 scientists here in, in various disciplines, um, whether it's solar physics, astrophysics, planetary physics, identify scientific questions. They propose mission concepts to the space agency, so ESA and NASA being the biggest two. Uh, and when they get accepted uh, and um, sort of book some space on a satellite, they then come back to us engineers who design, build, and then put the, the form. So that box there is what I'm in charge of, is designing, building, testing, and then sending the instruments to the space, getting it integrated with the spacecraft and then flying them off. All right. And then all the data comes back. Once it's launched, we, we calibrate it, make sure it's working. And then all the data starts coming back. And then the instrument operation and analysis of that data, then, uh, you know, gives into interpretation, verification of models, and then they start asking more questions. So we are building on previous missions um, and, um, and look into the future. So that is a constant sort of a life cycle of, of what we do here at MSSL. So about the sun, it's really, really far away, um, about 150 million kilometers. Um, and it's, you know, massive. It's sort of the 99.8% of the mass of the solar system is all concentrated in a single point. And the surface temperature is about 550 degrees. So um, we have been studying the sun since 60, 
since the days of Galileo in the 1600s. And there's some of the reason, some of the, whose original pictures are still reproduced or preserved um, and are digitally un, under the Galileo project where he was studying these dark spots in the sun. So, um, and those dark spots we still see today, uh, not necessarily the same ones, but the, um, is it, in the interest, interesting range, it's these dark spots that uh, fascinate us in the, when we're looking at them. So I'm not saying you should no direct look at it directly, but with solar telescopes or with pinhole cameras, you can actually see that um, these dark spots on the sun. Um, and they vary in number and it, we've now attributed it over that sort of 400 years, we've attributed it to a 11 year cycle. Um, the last minimum where we're very, very few sunspots was sort of the beginning of 2018 and we're slowly building up to a maximum, um, which is sort of 2025. Now, so in the visible range, it's very uninteresting. When we get to start looking at the sun in the other wavelengths, uh, UV, it becomes a lot more chaotic and we try and understand how the sun works. So this is a picture in uh, ultraviolet wavelengths of the sun, of its atmosphere, what we call the corona, um, and all the, the plasma that is moving around in that atmosphere. Um, now, when we start going in detail and we start looking at it, you can see the, the video here. Uh, these loops are plasma that is escaping from the surface of the sun. So plasma is a superheated gas that has lost uh, a number of, um, uh, it's lost some of the electrons and these ionized. Um, and that sort of follows these loops. And these loops are actually magnetic fields, individual like bar magnets, as it were, on the sun's surface. Um, and it can be very dramatic. And some of these, sometimes the plasma's got enough energy to escape this. And that's when you start getting the solar wind or solar flares, or even if it's really violent, something like a coronal mass ejection. Um, so the scale of some of these loops, if you put the earth next to it, you can see it's even bigger than us. Um, um, and these are very, very violent. So in different wavelengths, the sun is actually a fascinating um, environment. So these escapes of plasma, this corona, the activity on the surface creates a type of weather, and then we call it space weather. And this sort of space weather does affect the rest of the solar system and the earth particularly us um, and it's our magnetic field that's actually protecting us for a lot of these the bombarding particles um, um, we have sent up several missions to try and understand our magnetic field um, and try and understand more about this space weather there was um I think there's a series two coming out called Cobra, but series one of Cobra on the sky. The reason I'm mentioning it is because that actually the disaster in it is a space based solar flare that knocks out our, our electrical system. And the science in it is actually pretty, pretty spot on. There is um, sort of probability that someday that, you know, our solar flares will knock out our electricity and that's what we're prepared for. What is actually missing in that drama series is the fact that we don't have any space weather satellites out by the sun monitoring the sun to actually do these flares and that's something we are looking in the next generation of, of uh, satellites is actually trying to get space weather out there. Okay, so some of those things, if you've got the sun at the core, at the, the centre of that, that picture, you can see sort of the, the lot of the, the, these plasma uh, flares and, um, and the eruptions from the surface of the sun actually start affecting all the, all the particles around the Earth. And that's when we get the aurora borealis. Um, but it also causes interference in our satellite communications. It causes eddies in our surface of our our planet so you can sometimes get eddy currents um, which affects electricity distribution um, there's also radiation and, and particles that affects um, our, our any work we do on the um, international space station um, and as well as radiation damage on any of our satellites so uh, trying to monitor this and understand it has been something that we could that is not affecting, it's affecting our way of life, our civilization, as it were, rather than actually life on the planet. Okay, so sort of the other sort of things, meteors, um, 
radio wave disturbance, um, airline passenger radiation, all these things are attributed to sort of the, the, the waves of plasma that we are in, uh, experiencing from the sun. And with all that, back in 2003, um, ESA, the European Space Agency developed, decided to develop Solar Orbiter and it wanted a satellite that it would go up until now we've always moved so our solar satellites have always been the same sort of orbit as the earth we wanted to go closer um, and also to try and look at the, the sun at um, increasing solar latitudes try and get a good view of the sun try and see what's at the poles we've never seen what's at the poles and um, also we wanted to carry both what we call in situ sensors so those sensors are the ones that are measuring properties around the spacecraft itself um, to actually identify things from, that's emanating from the sun as well as remote sensing payloads that are coming from the solar wind okay so a bit about solar orbiter itself um, it's a 1.8 metric ton spacecraft um, its science payload is just over 200 kilograms um, it's was the body of it was just under three meters cubed um, and the solar rays deployed once they deployed in space it was all folded up when it was in the rocket and so it then deployed the boom which is about four meters out the back it deployed the um, uh, radio antenna that's those three very spindly things at the front that's the rpw um, radio plasma wave um, uh, instrument at the front and then it deployed its solar panels which are about 18 meters long um, the pay, power to run all there's 10 instruments um that are um, there's, so there's 10 groups of scientists from around the world each of those instruments are led by a primary country but they got bits and bits and pieces um, built from different countries because no one country could afford to make one instrument um and the um one i'm responsible for is the one at the bottom the solar wind and plasma analyzer so it's looking at the different types of plasma that are coming off the sun and measuring them and that's as a project manager i was responsible for okay so i'll get this running so february 2020 just before lockdown we all piled into february we all piled into Florida um, and it was launched um, and you can see it launched from Florida from the earth in February 2020 and this is sort of a um, shows the, the route of the uh, solar orbiter so December ended last year it reached Venus it uses a uh, gravity assist to change its direction so that's why it's bypassing Venus using that slingshot itself um, so it's coming up for a slingshot in, in about a month's time, coming past Earth and using it to slingshot itself back into a change. So it can then get into an orbit that once it's settled itself down, there it goes, it starts settling down into a, an a elliptical orbit. And then it will use Venus every time it flies past Venus to slightly change its attitude. So it go, starts moving up the sun and start looking down. And so that's, this is sort of planned. So where we are um, at the moment is it is approaching the Earth at the moment. There is a website that um, if you look in where is Solar Orbiter into Google, it will tell you exactly where Solar Orbiter has been and where it is currently and how far it is and how much delay we get between sending commands to it. Okay, so I'll let this run. But the plan is to from November this year, this is starts the full scientific uh, mission, uh, and that will run to around December 2026, and then we'll start running in what we call the extended mission, um, which is, um, you know, if Orbit is still using its systems, we can still still running. So that's all there. Okay. So Solar Orbit itself, like I said, it's was built in Stevenage uh, at Airbus Stevenage, just outside London. Uh, so completely British built spacecraft with 10 payloads, um, four instruments that are measuring um, uh, 
properties actually at the spacecraft, um, radio waves, magnetic waves, elect, um, high energy particles, and then what we call the solar wind analyzer, or SWA. Okay, so SW is made up of three sensors. Um, we call them HIS, PASS, and EAS. HIS uh, sits at the front, at the top, uh, look, peeking over um, the, the heat shield. Um, PASS is, sits uh, on the same side, but at the bottom, peeking over the heat shield. And I'll explain a bit more about those two in a minute. Um, and then our electron um, and an EAS sits at the back on the long boom, um, trying to get away from the spacecraft as far as possible um, because it's picking up electrons. And what we don't want to pick up is electrons that are affected by the spacecraft. So um, some electron, as electrons are coming past the spacecraft, the electrical um, magnetic EM signature of the spacecraft may alter the, the, the path of those electrons. And therefore they might, we might are not measuring pure roots and energies of those electrons. So that's why EAS is at the bottom of the boom um, and trying to get away, still connected to the spacecraft, but as far away as possible. Okay. Um, so if you see, look at the front of the spacecraft, we've got this huge uh, thermal shield that is always directed towards the sun where possible. Uh, because they're trying to tuck the rest of the spacecraft behind it. Um, elect electronics don't like hot temperatures. You know, anybody who's left their, their iPhone near a radiator or, or left it out in their car under the sun will can tell you that the electronics do not like. And we try and design our electronics for to be working in a minimum of minus 55 um, and up to a maximum of about 40. Um, we have to balance the thermal environment within the spacecraft to actually keep that in temperature range, even though irrespective of what's happening outside of the, the space itself. So we, we're we trying to get so solar water is built with, behind this heat shield with little shutters for all the, the telescopes, as you can see on that spacecraft, um, because the actual spacecraft predicted temperatures and the temperatures we actually are seeing on that surface about 500 degrees C. And what we're trying to do is keep all the electronics behind it the sort of room temperature. Um, again, they, so you can see from the solar, the colours on the um, solar panels there that um, uh, they get hot too and they can stand a little bit more to heat, but they actually, as the closer they go to the sun, they actually twist to go try and go edge on to try and minimise how much uh, heat they actually absorb. Okay. So what I was going to do now is talk about the solar wind analyzer, which is my, I'm in charge of these four, three sensors and um, what we call DPU. So the introduction to them now, um, EAS, this is the one that sits at the back of the spacecraft. It's electron analyzer system. Uh, it's built here in the UK. It's actually built by my team here at MSSL um, and some of the, with parts supplied by um, our partner in Paris called LPP, who's the, the Paris, uh, one of the Paris universities. Um, the uh, HIS is the heavy ion sensor. So EAS is, is measuring the energy and the direction of different electrons. HIS is looking at different sort of ions of sort of basic elements like oxygen, carbon, uh, sort of helium, um, looking at the, trying to pick those up. It's uh, built by uh, Southwest Research in Texas um, with some help from uh, IRAP, which is a university in Toulouse in France. Um, and they also got some help from sort of Michigan and the University of Michigan, the University of New Hampshire and NASA as well. And that's what the big one that sits at the front at the top, look overlooking. So you can see it's got a little slit. Um, that's the aperture while the rest of it is trying to protect the instrument from the heat. Um, and then we've got PASS, which is below at the bottom of the spacecraft. That's the proton alpha sensor. It's picking up protons and alphas in the, um, in the solar wind, and that's built by IRAP in Toulouse. With a little bit of help from us, some electronics came from us. What we try and do is because these things are very expensive to build and very time consuming and labor intensive, 
we ch if there's a similar technology that we can share. Um, so we built some electronic board for PASS. PASS built some electronic boards and uh, the actual entrance aperture for HIS. We can share some of these technologies we have done to try and minimise cost and, and actually sort of promote different ways of doing things uh, and working together as a team. And then these three sensors are connected to our data processing unit or the DPU, which is this little black box that sits actually inside the spacecraft. And we're all connected together by meters and meters of harness. Um, and that DPU was built by IAPS, um, which is a, a research facility in Rome on, with the Italian government. So the way this works is each of these instruments were actually funded by their own countries. Um, so I don't actually have contracts with these people. I had to sort of beg, steal, borrow, be very nice, say nice, please, to actually get them to do stuff. So that's that's a very um, and there's trying to work together with different nationalities as sort of over the last fourteen years has been an absolute honour and a pleasure, but also been exciting and challenging uh, as getting used to uh, the way different people, do, different cultures work. All right, so. I was going to talk about EAS, the Electron Analyzer System. So the way this works, I don't know if I, if you can see my, hopefully you can see my, is you've got an electron coming in uh, with a negative charge and the green um, curves are actually curved surfaces on the, on the analyzer itself. And these are positively charged. So it's attracting the electrons in. Um, by having different charges on those those green plates, the differential can kind of select what sort of energy level those electrons have. So you can actually sort of say, right, I'm going to look at all the, the low energy electrons or I'm going to look at high energy electrons just by differentiating the charge on those two plates. The electron comes in um, by the blue surface, we can actually we move it, we can move the electron down until it hits the detector at the bottom. So having all these different surfaces at different at different voltages, positive voltages, we can actually direct the electrons to the right um, where, where we want to go in the detector. And so if you can see the bottom right hand corner picture, you can see the curved surface behind this grid. Um, and the grid's there to actually kind of protect it and actually um, to protect the, the actual aperture and things. Um, the actual detector, the top right hand picture shows the actual detector. So at the bottom uh, of the um, curved surface of the head down here, is actually in that top left right hand picture. And that shows you the actual detector that, that the electron comes down and actually hits. And it's, it's got different, split into little different sectors. So we know which sector it is, and then from there they can work out angles and where it's coming from and things. On the left hand side is our cabinet of, of EAS. Now, EAS is actually two instruments. Um, we decided to build, um, you've got a head and you've got a set of electronics that A, supply the positive voltage, uh, the, the high voltage, and also um, actually operate when to turn the high voltages on and off. And, when to do, you know, to take in the data. Um, so EAS itself is actually split into two. It's got two sensors, two sets of electronics. Basically the way we did that is because if we lost one, uh, you still got one working, but also the fact when you've got two working together, it kind of um, anything, it kind of, some of the look directions that we have are blocked by the spacecraft and or are blocked by the um, the actual unit itself. So we actually tried we had two to work together to try and minimize any blocked areas within the, the, the total 360 view of the sky. Um, so we've got the uh, so the pink blocks are actually the 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 volume that the electronics components take up on the different boards um, and I could you know if anyone's got a particular question I can go in more detail about the boards but what it does is it takes EAS takes in about 28 volts it then boosts it up to two to three thousand volts and that's what it applies to these different surfaces to suck in the electronic electrons electrons come down and hit the detector 
and says, the detector says, I've got an electron, it's got this much energy, and that goes back to the, the electronics boards, and that all the information, all the data of it, counting all the different electrons, produces a two by sort of a, a very rainbow like pattern um, sort of grid, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, and then that data is collected and then set up to the DPU. The DPU then packages, you know, may do some calculations on it to see if it's any good data. Any bad data it throws away. And then the good data it packages is up and then saves to send to the spacecraft when the spacecraft's ready for it so they can then beam it back to the Earth. The solar orbit is designed because it's going to be at some points up to 80 days out of contact with the Earth. It has to do this autonomously. So that's you know, that's why we've got these different systems looking at the data on board, making sure it's correct. If it's not correct, it throws it away and then it goes from, from there. So when we start, so we normally when we when we start a mission, we come up with the, the scientists say we want to measure this, we want to measure the particles, um, we want to we want to use this type of detector. Um, it's going to be in this environment. Um, so we have to put together some schemes and some designs. We normally take with EAS, we took some of this and a couple of other missions that we've used plasma detectors on. We take those designs and we improve upon them or we try and improve. We try and improve upon previous designs that we know that work to try and save development time and development money. Um, and we do we start off with some basic designs. We do some thermal calculations, looking at the temperatures. And this is one of those pictures of one of our, our thermal modeler uh, looking at the temperature, saying, well, actually, it's going to be really, really cold because of these things are pointing out to space at minus 169 degrees C. They're going to get really, really cold. Um, we need some elect and the electronics are going to get really warm. They're a nice sitting there, like I said, a nice sitting there room temperature because it's got a blanket wrapped around it. Um, but we want to make sure we, we needed to do some work to keep to increase the the, um, the blue areas, trying to improve the temperature on the blue areas. Now, I always keep this in because this is actually quite an old uh, analysis, but it's one of the ones I did when, I, when we first did it um, for my thermal engineering. Um, and then we do a prototype. We try and say, will it work? So this is the prototype of EAS. We only did one side, we only did one head with some very, very um, um, basic boards um, and the components wired it all up and we've got the head design and we made some changes and we put that in the chamber, fired some electrons at it. Will it work? Can we start developing the software for it as well? Um, which, sorry, go back a bit, um, and use that to say, okay, this design of, of electronics, this design of the head, these dimensions, we think this is going to work in principle. Now we've got to make sure the design is robust to go into space. We do that, what we call with the structural thermal model. Can it survive? Can it survive? Ironically, it's the the worst environment it's going to see is actually on the earth when it's got these clumsy humans carrying it around um, and being bounced about and then they're going to put it on a rocket and the rocket's going to sh shake it about um, uh, and then once it gets to space it's fine uh, mechanically once it's in space we don't worry about it thermally um, it's a different story and we make sure that it survives its thermal environment but yeah, generally the, the, the most bumps and, and things dropped on it and, and everything, which is, is, is going to be when it's all these clumsy humans carrying it around. Um, so we build a structural thermal model. And what we do is two things we're looking at. We Firstly, is, is it going to survive its thermal environment? So the, the EAS is built um, structurally the same as the flight model design. Um, it may not be working, it may not detect it, be able to detect electrons, but all the parts are there. To, and if not, we've got bits of metal representing components with heaters to represent the power supply and the, the heat loss from the working electronics. And it's that's what they, and then we've got heaters on top to try and mimic the survival heaters. Um, and then we instrument it out with all the thermistors to read the temperature. 
Um, and you can see it's wrapped up in this thermal because the EAS is at the back of the spacecraft, it's in a very cold environment. So we need to keep it warm. So that's why it's wrapped up like a very badly wrapped Christmas present, like I've done it at Christmas Eve with 10 minutes to go sort of thing. Um, um, we were, what we were trying to do is say, right, look at the design of the thermal blanket, look at the de thermal design of the instrument, can we improve on it as well? We also then put it on a, on a shaker do a vibration test to simulate a rocket launch and see if it survives. Um, I don't have any video of that because basically it's moving so fast that you can't see it move. So um, generally it's easy to picture. So then from that we can measure all the responses. So we've got those blue wires connected up to the heads are actually accelerometers measuring the response um, from the, the actual shake and see if we, we are getting any resonant frequencies that we don't like and things. And then once we did built that, we said, OK, the design's fine. We think it's going to survive space. We then send it to the spacecraft. And the spacecraft has a list here. Um, this is in Stevenage. And you can see how big the solar auto is by the, the very, you know, the, the gentleman standing at the bottom here at the bottom. Um, the top on the right hand side, you've got a picture of, of PASS sitting out through its heat shield. That's an STM. And then the bottom is the EAS STM sitting on the end of, of the boom. Next thing we do, right, okay. So we know it, this structure is going to survive. We know it's going to thermally survive, but where is it going to work? So we start off with an electrical model. With the EAS, we started off with a detector, which is on the left-hand side, connected to the first, its brain, actually in AS, which is a, a big chip called an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, um, uh, which has got some onboard software. And that's where we start off. Can we actually get the detector to talk to the um, to the FPGA and get it, start getting working. And then from there, we start building EAS up until we have an actual working version of it. Um, it doesn't necessarily, with EMs, you don't necessarily have to be structured. So you can put it in any old box, but we decided to put it into an actual EAS box. Now, the reason I like this particular picture is because the young gentleman the short young gentleman by my engineer's side is my son. When I started Solar Orbiter, he was six months old. This picture was taken when, he, when we were doing the EM and he was about uh, seven, eight, six, seven years old. Uh, we launched last year. He is now 14 doing his GCSEs and training to be an engineer. This is sort of, so he's grown up with his mum, this being his sort of kid brother, because his mum's always said, oh, He's always joking that I'm always in the meeting, but it's this is how long sort of so you know these these programs take because we are developing and trying to make sure that they work and they work because we you know once they've gone we can't really change them. Okay, so also with EM, so this is the EM of SWA totally. So the EAS is in your top left, top right. Um, corner with its red cap on those caps are red to make sure that we take them off but when we need to we don't leave them on but they're there to make sure things don't go down the aperture next to it is pass as an em it, they just built the box of electronics the same with hiss which is this big silver box in your foreground and then the dpu again they decided just build a flight like model one so this is actually the all the electronics you need to simulate what eas will it would work and we decided right we're going to test this harness there's got to be a harness that goes between them because they're on different parts of the spacecraft it was you know it's not until you actually put 14 meters of spacecraft harness actually on the bench that you realize oh that is an awful lot and we had to make sure suddenly you know voltage drop signal loss over that distance then became a factor and we had to check do some changes from there so that's sort of testing but when we actually we actually, again, the EMs get sent to an EM version of the spacecraft. And when we tried to send them the harness, they said, that's a bit too big. So we ended up sending a little harness, but that goes to the spacecraft. Once we've done the EM, I said, right, we know it's gonna, it's gonna survive space. We know it's gonna survive. It, it works electronically with the software and everything else. Then you build the flight model, you get the clearance. And this is the EAS's flight model. The bottom left right hand corner is us looking down at all the um, at all the electronics 
inside as you can see we're now working on flight level boards there are, it's a lot neater a lot more precise the wiring is a lot more precise than the prototype um, and then we've got it up in the on the top left hand corner is it, it in the chamber where we fire electrons at it to make sure it works all right now going back i showed you the christmas present we decided well that was you know that was there was bits of it it wasn't working properly because bits were touching and it's not supposed to touch and it looked like a complete mess so my engineer here duncan who's he's actually grinning behind his mask um worked so well to actually neaten it up and there's a sort of we made a, a tailor's dummy we're in a plastic version using 3d parts or spare parts that we that were got uh, rejected during manufacture um, and this model is actually now in one of the, is actually in Manchester Science Museum um, it's actually the Taylor's dummy we used that to actually make the, the thermal blanket a lot neater so that's why the the, therm, the flight model sitting there which is currently on its way around the sun um, looks a lot better than the prototype we started out with all right, so there's also lots of other slight design changes. We looked at the this uh, copper strip coming out through the head is actually where we carry one of the, the high um, high voltage cables to the top plate, um, and we realised that that was difficult to thread a cable through and to gold plate it. So we had to switch it to aluminium. So that we changed it to an aluminium pipe that the cable runs through. Um, and so that was easy to, to protect. I mean, that once we built the, the flight model, that does actually do some low level acceptance testing. So this is this this big chamber, the vacuum chamber here at MSSL is used for thermal testing. It go so we go down to the vacuum of space and then we run it through. It's got a shroud over it that kind of mimics space temperature, um, and then we make we sort of go through make it go through functional tests to make sure check it out that it works in the in the actual environment and this is my senior engineer having a nap while he's waiting for the tea to get to temperature <clears throat> and then once we've done all that we accepted all the tests in the flight we know they're gonna they're ready to actually test we put them all together so this is the picture i've got of swa together the, the hiss uh the white gray is hiss the black and red is pass is EAS with its two um, red connectors on it, uh, red um, hats on it next to the DPU and it's sitting in our clean room, just checking out that it all works together with the DPU before we send it to the spacecraft. And then that spacecraft was over in Stevenage. Um, it was all built up um, and then sort of October put together at October 2018 uh, and it was sent over to Germany where they undergo its own shaker test and its own thermal test um, and finally uh, it was cl cleared for launch in October 2019 uh, at this picture of Airbus in Germany um, and that's sitting in its own its thermal chamber there being assembled again that's a picture of my son and you know this is a recent picture of him as age 13 next to eas uh, and it was october 19 it was flown over to the states um and they then in what at nasa it was encapsulated in the in the top of the uh top of the rocket scene there and then fitted to a ula uh, delta four rocket um, and then on the 9th of February 2020 uh, it was launched so it's a picture from one of my engineers of it launching in sort of quarter to midnight in February we were all outside in in by Banana Creek in, in Florida watching it watching it go and one of the chief engineers at NASA said to me <laughs> later he said it was the most boring launch ever because it was all green lights nothing went wrong so um so where is it now so if you put into google or use that link uh say where is solar orbiter you get to the this ESA website and it using the slider at the bottom it will tell you where it is or where it's been and it'll, then it'll tell you on the site date where it plans to go and there's sort of no deviations 
Now, so we launched in February 2020 and um, March 2020, I don't think no, nobody's going to forget because that's when we, or the whole country and the whole world went into lockdown. Um, is SWA, as soon as it was launched, about 12 hours later, so they turned all the instruments on apart from SWA. Because we're using high voltages and plasma, we need about 28 days for all the gases, all the atmosphere that's got trapped into the instruments to actually degas and come out into the vacuum. So there, it's, there's currently pure vacuum. So it's not until about mid-March, just as we're going into lockdown, that we actually turn the instruments on and start what we call commissioning, making sure they work, getting into using practices. Uh, this is our chief um, scientist, Professor Chris Owen. Um, and we had to do this. Normally we would go to Mission Control, which for ESA is in um, Darmstadt in Germany, where we have a number of engineers looking over the computers. We couldn't do that because of lockdown. So we had a webcam actually look at this on the right hand side picture, the computer on the right hand side is a webcam of the actual flight computer because that's not allowed to be connected to the internet um, of all the information coming down from the instrument and spacecraft. And he's having a web with all the other engineers trying to look at the data and see if it's right. Then in July 2020, we had first light. We had the first pictures released from all the different instruments um, of the EUI and the fee instruments, which are our telescopes that are studying the sun, giving us, you know, pictures of the sun we've never seen before. These are sort of more close ups of the sun, identifying some of the, we've got little, they're all excited because they call these little spots campfires. So that not only what's happening at a big level, they're realizing that at a lower level within the sun, we are getting all these sort of, um, these plasma buildups in the, the corona at a lower level. So that's what started the science. So that's come to the end of the talk. I've tried to get over that the sun is dynamic magnetic environment. Um, that's It's got a big impact in us, not only giving us life, but also, you know, um, there's some detrimental effects on our, our civilization going forward. But we still don't know a lot about it. It's 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 it acts like a star. It's a star. It's in our own back garden, uh, and so we're studying it. And and solar orbiter is going to the sun to attempt to address it. Um, and I talked about SWA and the, Con and the large international consortium I've led over the last couple of months, the last couple of, or last fourteen years, um, and which will make some of the scientific measurements. Okay, so as a few people want to thank, it's like Chris and Lucy and some of the other people at ESA. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much for listening. So if I stop sharing. Yeah, Chris, brilliant. Well, that was excellent. I mean, it was, oh, um, you know, sometimes you're never sure about subjects, but you've made it fascinating and mm. so clear and absolutely mm. wonderful. Well, and I hope you, so, because, 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 yeah, I could talk for hours on this, and, yeah. it's, <laughs> and yeah. it's trying to try to pitch it at the right level for yes. you. Yes, as a non-engineer, I particularly enjoyed the that you're taking it from prototype to the finished article because it just shows all the things that have gone on and how it gets to look pretty good at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we try to do. In in that, we know sometimes the engineers will say, "Well, that doesn't look right." You know, and we try and you know, one, if it looks right, it it, it feels right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, uh, my background is the fact that um, I started joined MSSL twenty years ago, and I worked on Beagle Two, uh, and then I worked on um, a, an instrument called Spire, which was launched successfully and operated for four years successfully on Herschel as a thermal engineer. And then I realized, my boss realized I'm very good at nagging people. So he made me a project <laughs> manager. Uh, and then I've been managing, so solar orbit was my, well, I managed a small project there. I was so good at it. I, and they gave me solar orbit and I've been managing that. I'm now also project manager for the VIS instrument on Euclid. And that's currently being, the spacecraft is entering the spacecraft testing phases. So, um, it's getting to the point of probably about the end of this year, we will hand it over and say it's not our responsibility anymore um, and let, let it go 
both. And then I'm currently in a proposal stage. We're building prototypes for some for a, a plasma detector. So EAS is Sun, the next generation of EAS. It's called Lagrange. Uh, it's looking at different plasmas on the sun. It's going to be a weather satellite out by the sun to actually give us more warning if there's any big um, coronal mass ejections. And that's working with the European Space Agency and the Met Office as well, funnily enough. As well. <laughs> so, um, and I think there's com there was, was a competition a couple of days to re rename Lagrange, give it another name. But, uh, um, but I can keep, that, keep those posted. But yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just uh, aware that the people probably have questions, so I suggest if uh, they unmute. Uh, although no, we've just had one from. Oh, yeah, if, if you just write it in the chat, and then I can speak to it. So hello, oh, Derek. Okay. okay, everybody, can you write them in the chat? Yeah, please? write them in the chat. We go for hello, Derek. Derek, you actually come from where I was, where I grew up, and went to school. All right, because mm -hmm. I went to school in Sutton in Surrey. I went to Greenshaw High School, just which is behind St Helier. So yeah, uh, so you're not too far from where I grew up. Um, Lee, what is the closest approach? <laughs> closest approach is um, what we call a third AU, 0.3 of an AU. So it's 50 million kilometers. That's the closest it's gonna get. Now there is a satellite called the Solar Parker Probe, which was launched just before Solar Orbiter and was actually developed in parallel with Solar Orbiter with NASA. And that's going to get go straight into the sun when it's finished going round and round. They're going to fly into the sun. That's going to go closer. But originally, when we first started solar, it was going to be the closest, which is about fifty million kilometers. Now, where's the? So it it does in its uh, as you saw in its um, over um, over orbit when it it gets fifty million kilometers and then it comes out to around about 200 million kilometers. It goes past us and comes out to 1.4 AU. Um, and the way it deals with solar panels, when it comes up to the point three, they turn, they twist to their edge on. So they're minimizing how much the end, the area that the, the, the radio actually sees. So that's how they try and do that. Okay, so um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, right, I'm waiting for another. I was trying yeah, to type question. my question. Can I ask it? Go on then. Um, it's the thermodynamics of this. You know, you're in the rarefied atmosphere of space. So, how, what does this design look like? You haven't got the opportunity to move air around as you would on a, say, a gas no. turbine to cool no. the blades. So, I can understand the modeling, but how do you get the right temperature in the right place? Right, okay, so if it's too cold and you want it warmer, that's easy. That's putting a heater on it, and that just costs you power. Right, you warm that up. Um, if it's too hot and you want it cooler, if it was a car, because I used to work for a car don't designing thermal systems on cars, um, you would blow air over it and, and things, but you can't do that in space. We work on conduction uh, and radiation, so we're playing tricks with radiation. So what you tend to do is you use conduction bars to move the heat somewhere out, normally out to the surface, and then you've got what we call a radiator. Now, um, the quirk of history is radiators you and I know that are sitting in your rooms are not radiators as such, they're convectors because they're heating the air around it and it's the movement of air over those radiation over those radiators that are that are moving it away from the source to actually heat the room. Our radiators are pure radiators. You are, are using the um, balancing the heat of the panel with the, the, the coldness of space to actually radiate the heat away. And then you play how much that heat radiates away is by how, what coating and what color those radiators are. So they're in the two sense of the form. Those are, we, we try and move the heat through connecting it with a, normally a copper bar to a radiator and then it radiates the space. It's good that the space is actually quite a good sort of cold source. So all the things that on the front of the heat shield, um, they have got little radiators that are pointing to the cold bits of space. 
Now, the heat shield itself is the reason it, it, it goes from 500 down to room temperature is it's made up of lots and lots and lots and lots of layers. And um, by having those lots and lots of layers, you are cutting down the radiation um, from between those, in, cutting down the radiation yeah. going backwards. So you're cutting down the temperature difference. So that explains that. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and yeah. presume that your, mod, your modeling must be very accurate then. Well, yeah, the European Space Agency use something called ESASAN, European Space Agency Thermal Analysis Network. Um, and that's a piece of software that was developed in the UK um, that uh, produce, you know, you use a, take the CAD model, you put it into the, the CAD model, and then you made it, it's like a finite element program. Um, and that produces a code that you can change. And that deals with radiation modeling because radiation modeling is never simple. And that deals with conduction, which is, is simple. Now, when we get to situations where we're putting somewhere like a, a, a buggy in space, buggy on Mars, you then have, we had to, when we, I did some work on Beagle 2 and, and on Beagle, on, uh, and on Pancam, we had to write some modelers to look at convection. Um, because you've also got then got the Martian atmosphere. So there are situations where, you know, it's not all, you know, everybody says radiation and conduction is, that's the only two things you get in space. No, when you get to Mars, you have to do, you have to do some convection. Mm -hmm. So. Great, thank you but, very much. Uh, I think oh. Derek, I'm back on the chat, uh, Chris. <clears throat> I don't know if he's sent it. Oh, has he sent it to me? Okay. Yeah, um, I can't say it. Yeah, okay. 20, I don't understand it. 28 days to degas. Are there any, in brackets, little vent to let this happen? Yes. We put little holes. Um, <clears throat> and Okay. So all the way through production, our detectors are actually sensitive to oxygen and humidity. So we have to keep, when we have to keep those under pressure, under dry nitrogen, um, where possible. Um, and so we've got a system where that's feed the, of pipes over EAS that's feeding dry nitrogen in. Conversely, when it gets up into space, we actually the um, it, those vents that we're putting dry nitrogen in actually get the, the gas out. So there are little vents that are all the way through, and there's there's little holes on the on the blankets themselves that allow the gas to escape from the layered blankets, because those blankets are made up of very multi layers. That's why it takes twenty eight days. That's such a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions for anyone? Any more questions? No. No, well, I think you did a very good job of explaining oh, what you. you were doing. So. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, just thanks. Thanks from us, Chris. I mean, thanks yeah. to the IMAC supporting Ada Lovelace Darling. It's wonderful that you've got a son who wants to be an engineer. Oh, uh, oh hold on. No, Lee's come back. Is it? It's oh. work. Yeah, it's currently working. Um, it's, um, we're currently, we, for the first six months of 2020, so up until about September, we were doing commissioning, making sure it worked. And then because it's still on its way to the sun, it doesn't actually reach its first solar point until March, November this year. In the meantime, it's been doing all, it's been monitoring things. As it goes by Venus, we've been taking measurements for our Venus. A um, lot of the data is still in sort of, the, they're processing it and making sure it's right and see if they get any sense out of it. So I would say, Lee, watch this space you if you go to the european space agency website and go in solar orbiter a lot of the scientific things that are coming out should come out from that site to the public okay right Thank you. as the results are expected <laughs> at the moment from our side from swa yes but as you can see there were the the photos from eui and and phil which are the two of the telescopes were amazing they weren't expecting to see such detail no. Yeah. The sun. The trouble is with all CGI on on sci-fi movies now, everybody expects there's all are expecting those sort of sort of pictures, and you don't realise well actually that is real. That's not CGI. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, they're very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you 
yeah thank you very much um, thank you guys for talk, thank Chris. You. it was really clear and informative yeah and fascinating so okay. good luck with your with the, with the future basically with future. all right thank yeah. you very much everybody yeah. and, thank yeah, you very much. keep thank in you. touch all right and thank yeah. you Okay. Oh, really good, Chris. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. 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 So, I think everybody muted, so you didn't get too many claps. <laughs> That's all right. No, it's fine. That's fine. Oh, all really right. Good. Take care. Good luck yeah, and yeah, happy yeah, and yeah, love yeah. day. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. 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 It's very good. Bye, Derek. Bye, bye, Derek. Yeah. Sure. Can we go? Yeah. Yeah, we're done. I'm gonna end it for.